use a little help staying in shape. And many of us rely on our fitness tracker to help keep us accountable. But have you ever wondered how accurate it really is and does it matter? Lisa Cadmus Bertram is an assistant professor of kinesiology and epidemiology at UW Madison who's done some research on this issue. Nice to see Welcome. you. Good afternoon to both of you. So I guess that's the six million dollar question. Are they accurate? Yeah, so it's a really great question, especially with so many people relying on these devices and hoping that they'll, you know, encourage them and motivate them to be able to live a healthier lifestyle. And so I think that one of the important things to remember is that we're asking these devices to track a lot of different metrics. So we know that they tend to be pretty accurate for measuring steps. So that's, I think, very good news for people who use them for that purpose. That's probably the number one thing people are looking at. Um, one of the things that tends to be a little bit more challenging for any device to measure is calories burned or energy energy expenditure. So I know a lot of people are using their tracker to help them maybe to keep track of how many calories they're eating versus how many calories they're burning or to help them with weight loss efforts. So, so you have to input that information for it to figure out your age, your weight, that sort of thing. That's right. So it's looking at your age, it's looking at your gender, your weight, it's probably looking at whether you're pregnant or whether you're nursing a baby and taking all that information into account and it's trying to guess how many calories you burn per day. So it doesn't know your own it body obviously. Know. So it doesn't know if you're a person who tends to be um, have more fat tissue versus if you're somebody who's extremely muscular then you might be more burning more calories than the tracker thinks. So it's relying on a lot of guesswork um, but the important thing I think that people can take from it is to know that if you're shooting for you know let's say burning 300 calories more per day than you're taking in and you're trying to lose weight that way and it's not working for you that don't worry too much about whether the tracker is absolutely accurate it just is telling you that probably you need to create that deficit that's a little bit bigger. Wonder, so, now when it comes to steps you have an interesting situation. I used to have a Fitbit and I did like 10 and 11,000 steps a day now I have a Samsung mm -hmm. and a 6,000 is what they recommend, and I get about six or 7,000, but nowhere near 10 or 11,000. Is that tracking differently, or is it operating differently? Yeah, so it's almost certainly not tracking differently. Um, the internal mechanism of all fitness trackers is essentially the same, and then they're running those raw data through their own proprietary algorithms that each company has designed separately. So if you wear two different trackers, they might give you slightly different numbers of steps at the end of the day. The difference is that Fitbit and Garmin have made their own decisions about what goals they want to give people. Fitbit is relying on the goal that's most emphasized by public health officials, which is 10,000 steps per day, and Garmin is choosing um, a less ambitious or potentially more realistic goal. Um, like 6,000, like Yeah, you which can be yeah. a great yeah. idea, and some of the Garmin devices will actually adjust the goal over time. Um, so we're always trying to strike that balance between motivating people to do more and also not giving them goals that are so high that they're going to discourage people or, or just kind of be um, so ambitious that they're hard to reach. What other so sorts of things should you track? Um, I think that steps and um, minutes of physical activity are probably the most important ones. So people uh, might be interested to know that we do have national physical activity guidelines that come out every 10 years and the newest that was just released in November. So we have updated guidelines that say that we should be doing 150 minutes a week of moderate to vigorous intensity activity. So it can be running, uh, cycling, swimming, even brisk walking for most people, especially for older folks, um, can be a very um, excellent way to exercise. Um, so when you're looking at the tracker and it shows you something like active minutes, that's actually probably the best metric that you can use to see how you're stacking up against getting those 150 minutes a week. And it's motivation for a lot of people. Oh, definitely, yeah. It absolutely is. I mean, I think that getting that understanding of where you're starting from and um, getting a better sense of being able to measure your own assessment of your activity each day is one of the biggest um, benefits that you can get from using a tracker. Yeah, I'm on the treadmill and after 20 minutes, like, great job, keep it going, you know, that sort of thing. How accurate, speaking of being on the treadmill, is it at recording your heart rate? Is that similar to calories burned where it's it can't quite uh, modify itself to your, your own... That's a super question, and it really depends on one thing, and that is whether you're at rest or at ex exercise. At rest, they're very good. Most people don't care about their heart rate at rest. They're more interested in their heart rate during exercise. Now, during exercise, there's a lot of noise, so it might be at one second measuring you 10 or 20 beats too high, and then at the next second, 5 or 10 or 20 beats too low. It averages out over time. So if you look at the average heart rate um, over a walk that maybe was 20 or 25 minutes, it's going to be about right. 
If you're using it, for example, let's say you're doing a 10K run and you're jogging along and you're feeling pretty tired and you're saying, oh, I wonder what my heart rate is right now, and you check, that's not a good use because you might be seeing a number that's misleading in terms of how high or low it is. Interesting. So essentially compared to a heart rate monitor that's on with an electrode placed on the chest, like the chest strap monitors, um, there's just a lot more bumps and noise, and that's just because it's a lot harder, you know, to measure through the skin with, with a light on your wrist than it is to actually have an electrode on the chest. So the answer is it depends. Thanks for being with us. Put on the really interesting. Yeah, it's great motivation, though. Thanks for being with us. Great to see you. My pleasure.